So Critical Role Campaign 3 just got a whole lot more interesting. Hello everyone, welcome back to Fraud on the Telly. In today's video, we're gonna be going over everything that happened in Critical Role Campaign 3, episode 67, an episode in which Fern made a contract with Asmodeus? We're gonna be diving into all of the insanity that happened this episode, as well as what it means for the future of Critical Role Campaign 3. As always, if you enjoyed the video, learn something new, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. I recently got into a car wreck, actually yesterday, so I would really appreciate it if you liked the video. Okay, so where we last left off in our story, Bell's Hells were venturing into the Umbra Hills in Taldore to retrieve a certain type of flower, a very poorly named flower mat. They're going to retrieve this flower because they need it in order to heal Keyleth's wounds after the crazy fight with lewdness uh, during the Apogee Solstice and all of those Predathos shenanigans. As I said, the party are currently in the Umbra Hills, one of the most interesting places in all of Critical Role in Taldore, in Taldore lore. The Umbra Hills was actually the location of fighting for the uh, basically the origins of Taldore as a nation, a fighting between a, a King Dressig, the current kind of human leader hundreds of years ago, uh, in this area against um, basically the elves, dwarves, and the humans who didn't want to deal with his bullshit. One of the humans who was the champions of this fight was Zan Taldore, who would later become the uh, first kind of empress leader uh, of the Taldore nation. The reason these hills are forever scarred black is because King Dressig thought it would be a good idea to make a deal with a demon. Now this place is basically a, uh, a festering ground for demonic activity and a place where demons can come over into the prime material. As they're searching for these flowers, they discovered a recently destroyed stronghold. The stronghold was of the Platinum Dragon Worshippers of Bahamut. They've set up this stronghold, uh, I presume, for a long time now in this area in order to deal with, basically, uh, potential demonic uh, insurgents into the prime material plane. However, it seems like this time, things have been going so well for them. Our party sees there are a number of demons and imps, as well as a Nilfashini, a very a scary big old demon boy that seemed to have uh, come through onto the material plane and have wreaked havoc here uh, in this former temple, former, uh, I guess, bastion of Bahamut. Luckily, though, our party are not alone in this pretty crazy combat, as out of nowhere, there is some sort of uh, devil-ish entity, very strong, handsome devil entity that appears that Fern somehow convinces to aid them in their fight. After a very long series of combat, eventually all of the demons are destroyed and those who survived are rescued. We learn, though, that this winged devilish figure is none other than a champion of Asmodeus. Basically, he drops some crazy bombshells on us and tells us that right now there is basically a armistice, a ceasefire between some of the betrayer gods, maybe all of them, we don't know, and the prime deities. The only other champion of Asmodeus that we know of is Xerxes. God, if this would have been Xerxes, that would have been absolutely crazy, but Matt's not going to go that far. But basically, this is a really big deal. We learn that the betrayer gods, like we said, at least some of them, Asmodeus particularly, are willing to work with the prime deities in order to battle Pradathos. The emergence of Pradathos and Ruidus, as we know, Pradathos has the ability to eat gods has basically shaken all of the gods to their core, including the betrayers who are still sealed away in whatever domain that they exist in. But basically, Asmodeus has ordered his champions uh, to basically go and attempt to deal with this problem. It's interesting because the champion makes a comment that basically now, because all of the gods are under potentially threat of death, and it's very hard to kill a god, they suddenly now remember that they are in fact kin. They are in fact all related to one another. Now, if you thought this scene couldn't get more crazy, you're, you're wrong, because of course it does, because we are with the Chaos crew and the captain of the Chaos crew, Fern Calloway. Fern somehow gets tempted into making a pact with the champion and with Asmodeus, as he burns a symbol of Asmodeus into her hand, basically telling her, should she need the power and should she need to call on it, she can, and the pact was sealed. Now, the only other time we've seen something like this in Critical Role was in Campaign 1 with the Devil uh, Pact, or maybe it was a Fiend Pact. I believe it was a Devil Pact that Percy made, but I don't think he ever actually acted upon it. My memory is really bad right now, though, guys, so if, I, if I'm wrong, please let me know in the comments down below. So it's very interesting to see what exactly is going to happen here. For the longest time, we've had this setup of Betrayer Gods versus Prime Deities. This is how it's been proposed to us and really how 
we were led to believe, uh, believe the, how this situation happened until the events of EXU Calamity. And then now, with basically all the events that are going on um, with Pradathos and how the gods are responding, we're getting a very interesting look about really the kind of morality of the gods, their true nature, how there really isn't potentially a ton of difference between the Betrayer Gods and the Prime Deities, besides the fact that the Betrayer Gods do very much want to just kill everyone. But you see, maybe it wasn't always like that, and I think that Campaign 3 has really done a cool, fun job of teasing out this kind of nature between the gods and really flipping it on its head. Matt has really gone away from a lot of the traditional tropes uh, in kind of D&D, &D, you know, Baldur's Gate, all of that between, like, these good and evil gods. It seems that everything is a lot more grayer than that in a lot of ways, and kind of the introduction of Pradathos, this other entity that all of a sudden is a threat to the gods, has really... Well, it's really let them show their true colors. Campaign 3 continues to surprise me. They are by far the most chaotic of any of the Critical Role campaigns, and it leads for some absolute insanity, and I've really enjoyed every single minute of it, even the slower bits, don't get me wrong, because it has there has been some slower bits. But still, I really look forward to see the resolution eventually on this whole entire story, and just what absolute chaos that Ashley and Fern will ensue now with the introduction of Asmodeus, potentially as a patron, as a like a patron god to one of our party members. As always, if you enjoyed the video, learned something new, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts on everything that happened in this episode. If you want to learn more about uh, Critical Role, whether it's the gods or the history of Tal'Dorei, then why don't you go check out our Critical Role Lore Explained series or click one of the videos on screen now. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching the video. I hope to see you in the next one. Until next time, stay safe out there. Peace, love, Auto.